Hello everyone and welcome back to the Cyclocross Social Podcast. They will be talking about the super prestige that took place on the Max Plus and I'm joined by Twan to do that. Hey Twan. Hello. We watched the fourth round already of the Super Prestige. This is the race that used to be in Hoogstraten called the Aardbeienkross. But last year it moved to Merksplas. Or actually the year before, but that got cancelled. Last year it did happen. Van Turenhout won. And today in the men's race we didn't have Van Turenhout at the start. He had a cold and Isabit said something about a knee injury. So he wasn't at the start. It's unsure if he will start in Coxside tomorrow. And it was the fastest, fastest start for Quinton Hermans. And he put up the pace. But he didn't really create any gaps. It was Ryan Kamp who did that. Kamp paced hard. And that eventually led to a breakaway of six riders. But Kamp was one of the first to actually drop there. He exploded, got back pains. And then had a crash and withdrew from the race. That left us with five leaders. Those were from Paul Sauze, Isabit and Laura Sveik. From Boaz, we had Arts and Van der Haar, and then we had Quinten Hermans there from Tormans. Van der Haar, throughout the rest of the race, was kind of yo-yoing from the back end of that group. He was Then he was dropped, then he came back, and that's basically how his race went. Isabit was sitting in the wheels until it was two and a half laps to go. He thought his time had come, he launched an attack, and it was Arts who followed him. We had then two leaders, Isabit and Arts, with two laps to go, and Isabit made a mistake, he crashed. And Arts could pass him. So it didn't look too severe for Isabit. But it did mean that Sveik and the Hermans could come back. Then we came to a slight downhill with an off camber. And Arts was leading. But Isabit launched it down the inside. Arts was not amused by that move. And he kind of was caught off guard there. And he looked frustrated. And from there on Isabit opened the gap and managed to extend that. Arts did a lot of hard work. But didn't matter anymore for Arts. Arts blew himself up. It was Hermans who kept on chasing, but Isabit could keep his lead and claim another victory here. He took his 10th win of the season already, ahead of Quinten Hermans who managed to outsprint Laura Sveik for the last places on the podium. Let's talk a bit about that race, Twan. We saw that Eli Isabit was sitting in the wheels for throughout the most of the race. What did you think of that? Was that a smart tactic? I think, especially with the eye on tomorrow, it's, it's just a very solid tactic. You don't need to go from lap 2 or 3 today. Uh, it is very tough to actually be able to do that. It is better to wait till like, the final 15 minutes of the cross and try and uh, split up the field by then. Because people will be trying to push the pace and you just gotta make sure that you stay on, in contention until then. I definitely agree. It's something we've seen Isabit do more this season. Wait, wait, wait. In the meanwhile, Arts and Hermans usually do a lot of work. Today, no different. Arts and Hermans were doing a lot of work. And especially on a parkour that was, in my opinion, somewhat boring. It didn't have really any standout features. Really hard to make a difference. We saw Isabit made a difference eventually by just pacing harder than the rest. So... Yeah, I don't really see why you would be doing all that work. I don't know what you think. Um, Arts and Hermans, did they go too early in terms of putting the power down? They did. I mean, you have to put a bit of pressure on because there's always that opportunity that people make the mistake and a gap opens up that they're not really able to close. But you, you could always push it a little bit more than the person ahead of you, like when you're trying to come back. So it was like relatively easy easy to get back for all five of them because like they're on very similar uh, abilities and i mean yeah you're just hoping for someone else to make a mistake and then put the power down it's it's not really the greatest tactic and i i think he's been played it very well but at the end of the day someone has to push it yeah someone has to do it and I mean, it's maybe not the smartest from Hermans and Arts, but on the other hand, if they sit back and do nothing, they're caught in the team game of Paul Sauser because you know that if you do nothing, Isabit and Sveik will go 1 2, and you know Sveik will let the gap fall, or maybe Isabit would have done it. So I think it's a bit hard for both. I mean, Arts did have Van der Haar, but Van der Haar wasn't great today. So if I think what could they have done differently, I mean, for Arts, the only thing I can think is when Isabit made that move down the inside, he should have like kept on going and or closed the door. That's basically the only thing I can think, because until then, I don't think Arts had done that much wrong. I mean, he had been leading, but usually when he was leading, he was dropping the pace so Van der Haar could come back. 
yeah, Van der Haar not really providing the support that Arts needed today, I think, and that he needed from himself as well. Just always in the final positions, basically from the first lap, um, from from like the first few corners, he was in trouble uh, and uh, was chasing the race the whole time, not really ever being in a position to put the hurt on someone else, but clearly still having the abilities to... If he had been in a position, he would have been very fine today, and I think he would have been like battling for the podium. I think for Van der Haar, he had two problems. The first one was running the barriers. It cost him around one to two seconds every lap, well, 10 laps, so it's between 10 and 20 seconds, which is a lot. And secondly, there was this technical part where Isabit was riding it every lap. Isabit crashed there eventually in the penultimate lap. And Van der Haar, he was riding this. The rest was running. So why is this an issue? Isabit could ride it at a fairly decent pace. It was about as quick as running for Isabit. Van der Haar, however, needed to slow down much more so he could take the line he wanted to take. This way he lost, I think, one, two seconds every lap there as well. I think Van der Haar was strong, but like... If you have these two places on the parkour where you lose time every lap and then add a bad start to that, you're going to be chasing the entire race. And that's kind of what happened for Van der Haar. He could only come back when Arch dropped the pace. And the laps that Arch didn't drop the pace, we saw that Van der Haar was distanced. However, let's focus on that move that I just mentioned in the penultimate lap where Isabit retakes the lead from Arch. What did you think about that one? I think it's uh, very opportunistic. It's uh, it's one of those moves where, like, I don't know. I, I guess he he felt the urgency to keep pre pressing on, keep pressing on, uh, and like, uh, I don't know. It's not a move that I would personally make. It, it felt like a lot of risk, and if Arts didn't really give him the space, it would have easily ended up in a crash, uh, which just wouldn't have been very beneficial to both of them. Yeah, I think the move itself, it's not wrong. There's no elbows, no heads, no contact even involved. But you're right, if Arts doesn't see him coming or thinks, well, I'm having none of it today and doesn't break, in that case, you are looking at potentially a collision between those two because Izabi did take a lot of risk there. Was it necessary in the end? Perhaps it was. I, I don't know. It, I, Izabi said he felt that Arts was dropping the pace so he could recover. And we did see that as soon as Isabit went back into the lead, he did open a gap because Arch wasn't able of properly responding. As soon as Hermans took over the chase of Arch, the gap stayed the same or perhaps even went down by one second. So was it necessary? Perhaps. Was it risky? Yeah. But did the risk pay off in this time? Yeah, I think it did. So Isabit can be happy taking his 10th win of the season. And yeah, I mean... Perhaps Sveik is the only one who could have done something. I think Sveik looks strong today. He looked very good, um, but I don't know. He, he also pressed on a lot in uh, like the start, the middle uh, of the race, and yeah, just maybe a bit under team orders to help Elie Um Yeah, and um, it's unfortunate. Finally, in the leading group, we of course had the Hermans. I think as well, Hermans, I mean, I just said maybe only Sve could have done something, but I actually also think that Hermans could have done something if I think about it, because Hermans once again was looking strong, but once again, he made a lot of mistakes. In my opinion, Hermans is too eager this season. He knows he has the form, he knows he has the power, he really wants to show himself, get that victory, but race after race, he makes a lot of mistakes. Yeah, quite a few in the technical sections, and I, I feel like it, indeed it really held him back today. Uh, and and it is just very unfortunate to see for him because he made some quite like crucial uh, stages of the race, and he certainly could have challenged Isabit more this race, and also in other races where he made like some mistakes where you're like, eh, it's not really necessary when you're this good. Exactly. I also thought it was interesting to see that for once he was running the barriers. Do you think that that has something to do with the crashes he had earlier this season on the barriers? I do imagine uh, from the hard comments on them being a bit shorter together. So I think uh, Hermans could maybe have just decided that it's not worth uh, risking losing like 10 seconds with one crash, but rather take it steady every single lap and lose like one, one and a half, two seconds, you know? 
definitely think that is possible. I think without a doubt that it has to do with his crash and that he knows that he, well, it's probably a bit of a hit of a confidence because as you said, he knows, okay, I lose this many seconds by running. If I crash, I lose this much. If you're really confident, you don't think, how much do I lose with one crash? You just think, okay, I'm going to jump them all the time and it gains me this much seconds compared to when I run. So I think it does have influenced the crashes he had earlier this season. But, well, I think overall Hermann's another solid performance. He's very, very consistent this season. A lot of podium finishes for him. Let's run down our entire top 10 then. We just discussed the top 5, which had that win of a easy beat ahead of Quinten Hermans. Third place for Laugensweek. Then we found the duo of Balwas, Trek, Tone Arts and Lars van der Haar. Sixth place for Corne van Kessel ahead of Dieter Zweig. Eighth place for Vincent Baastaans, ninth for Jens Adams and Niels van der Putte in tenth. Let's talk here about Corne van Kessel first in sixth place. I think van Kessel, he was just off the back of the leading group for quite a while. Also van Kessel had a relatively slow second and third lap, his start was alright. But nevertheless, I think Van Kessel, solid performance once again today because the parkour, like, didn't suit him at all. Yeah, we saw him uh, nearly threatened to come in t- back into the race as well. Uh, with, I think, l- about two laps to go, he came back into shot. Uh, so just riding a very steady race. And indeed, on the parkour, that doesn't really suit him that much, uh, at least from past experiences. I think definitely good to see Van Kessel improving. We talked about him earlier this season that in the States it wasn't what we had expected from him. But now he's looking to be back towards that consistent middle top 10 rider. And I think when the mud comes, well, which is probably next week in, I think, where we're going to Besançon, that should be a bit muddy. We also should see some different riders skipping there. Hermans and Van der Haar not going there, so... Perhaps uh, Van Kessel can have an outside shot at the top 10 there, because of at the podium, I must say, top 10 for sure. I would say the podium even, because I think Logan Zweig is also skipping, but there's no confirmation on that one. Rider behind, Dieter Zweig, has to be mentioned here, 7th place. I think this is a surprisingly good result from Dieter Zweig. Yeah, it must be a uh, season best performance and probably one of the best performances of his career. Uh, just a uh, a very, very solid performance, as you said. Uh, really promising stuff uh, in that Eco Crelon team. And I think they just uh, are looking w- what to do with him. And this kind of performance might uh, keep him on board. Yeah, the twin brother of Laugen Zweig, um, he is. And, well, I I have to say I'm very surprised. I mean, sure, this season I've seen him be better than previous seasons. I've seen him consistently improve himself. But, like, if I look at his results, this does still kind of come out of nowhere. I mean, sure, he was 8th in Rudervoorde, but Rudervoorde had less people at the start than here today. If we look for comparison... 5th in Oysterwijk, 21st in Gieten, 9th in Ardoje. Like Oysterwijk and Ardoje are not big races. And today is a big race. The start list was pretty stacked and 2nd and 7th. Surprised? Do you, do you think that he might be reunited with his brother in a team next year? It depends on where both of them go. Um, yeah, yeah, it will really depend on that, of course. We can take a moment to discuss that. We have had the rumors earlier that Zweig was on his way to Tormans. They tried to force a transfer before this cross season. That is off the table. Cross transfers happen after March because they are different teams than road teams. So that means that the transfer doesn't happen on the 1st of um, first of January, so there's still some time. Where do you think that Zweig will go? Do you think he will be leaving Paul Sousa? And if so, do you think he will want to take Dieter Zweig with him? I think it is. Uh, it, he is right to move away. Uh, it's not been the greatest combination at Paul Sousa, and uh, having more of his own team maybe it would be good. Uh, he used to have that, of course, as well. And, uh, I mean, if they have space and a budget for Dieter as well, I'm sure it would be a welcome addition. He has been uh, showing that he is worthy of a uh, pro contract with performances like this. I wonder if maybe Hans Maas is interested in signing him, because Vincent Bastans, who's riding the season of his career, is not getting a contract extension. They... The, they founded the team around him, and this year they only re-signed his contract for six months, or so for the cross-season. 
but he's on his way out, and I personally don't really understand that decision. Bastan's looking for a contract. Dieter Zweig, and I mean, by the looks of it, Lauren Zweig are also looking for a contract. Hence, Maas have said that they wanted to sign a top rider. The priority of Hens Maas is in Belgium. Laurens Zweig doesn't like these foreign travels. He preferably only rides races in the USA. In my opinion, it's a perfect match if they have the money. Yeah, it's uh, maybe not quite like the superstar they want, but it's just a very good rider that is going to get you top 5 results like at the start of the season and maybe later on as well and the occasional podium here and there and maybe something more as well. Uh, it it's it would be a very good statement signing I think for Hans Maas and uh, yeah they would do good uh, with that and yeah of course the rumor rumor of Tormans is still on the table and if he signs at Tormans then I don't think Dieter Sveik will go whilst if we look at Hans Maas I think Hans Maas will fit in Dieter Sveik into their roster it's kind of the type of rider they have because if we look Hans Maas today Pastans 8th and then if we look at their other riders Lokes and Meuse 16th and 17th so in a way, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Hens Maas does sign Swake, uh, both Swakes, I must say. But I guess we'll just need to keep an eye on that and keep our ears open to uh, see what we hear to them. For sure. Let's talk about the rider just outside of the top 10 then, Loris Roulier, riding for Alpes in Phoenix, ending 13th today. This is, in my opinion, also a solid performance by the fourth year under 23 from Switzerland. Yeah, this is more of the stuff that you would really like to see from him. I'm not quite making the development that uh, Opsin were probably hoping for after the junior category, but uh, it's good to see him uh, closer to that top 10 again. I think this is definitely a performance he can move forward from. Of course, there were under 23 riders in front of him. We had um, Niels van der Putte and Emil Verstringen, but then again... I think Roulier has made progression last year. He was really struggling. Of course, the COVID pandemic probably influenced him. And it's not strange, but this year he made solid progression. Also in the under-23 races, he's more towards the front. And what I really like today, he didn't blow up. We saw in the under-23 races, he often sets out fast and then falls back way outside of the top 10. Today, none of it. He was far back and... Basically the reverse, he overtook a lot of riders, for instance Kamp, who had a, of course a crash which caused them to DNF, but I like that. Let's talk about our women's race then, Tuan, tell us what happened there. It was a very good start by Lucinda Brandt and uh, in the technical section it would be Inge van der Heijer helping her out a little bit as she made a slight mistake and uh, she gave Lucinda Brandt a bit of a gap and then Alvarado uh, further holding the rest up as uh, she struggled even more to get through that after that little mistake by van der Heijer and uh, they wouldn't see Lucinda Brandt again she would go on to ride to uh, victory quite comfortably today and uh, Annemarie Worst, Denise Betma and Yara Kastelein would battle it out for the remaining podium spots Alvarado couldn't quite hang on to them and uh, it would end up being Anne-Marie Worst taking the second place with a very strong sand section, just able to position herself well, and uh, it, it, it was the second place for her, and Denise Betsma struggling a little bit more, which was quite surprising, uh, coming in third with Yara Kasselein taking up fourth. That win there of Lucien Labrand, I mean, a one-woman show. She said before the race that she didn't expect it, to be easy to ride away but in the first lap by leading I mean she was able to ride this section it was then Van der Heide who needed to get off the bike Worst was caught up behind Alvarado who made a mistake there and ever since there I mean there's nothing you can do if Brand has gone on a parkour like this it's a very very hard to come back and I think it just shows Brand certainly the strongest woman at the moment yeah, really finding that form uh, after the European, during the European Championships and after as well, uh, going on a bit of a winning streak and it's just looking very good. It's the Lucinda Brand that we saw last season, just strong all around. And um, yeah, really, this is the kind of thing Ton Arts and like Sveik, etc. and Hermans, they were hoping for when they were pushing from like a bigger mistake from some of the people behind and then a gap open up and capitalize on it. And Lucinda Brandt was able to do that. 
Yeah, that's the only thing you can hope for. The parkour, not very great in my opinion. It was, yeah, it was kind of boring. Also, not a lot of spectators, but that's of course due to new COVID restrictions. You need to wear a mouth mask now at all indoor and outdoor events in Belgium. So I can understand that the spectator numbers are pretty low, but the parkour itself, it's also it doesn't have any standout features in my opinion. So. Yeah, it's kind of... I, I didn't really enjoy watching it. It didn't help that Eurosport didn't have an English commentator. But, well, we have to do with it. I did like what I saw in the background. Worst, more improvements from her side. Her back finally looks to be solved. And I... Look, I am not per se a huge fan of Worst. But I just don't like seeing riders who I know have potential struggling. And to see Worst and do good again... I do like that. I do think she's now where she deserves to be based on the effort she puts in. She's always on the podium at least the last couple of weeks, and that's what I like to see. Yeah, and it's uh, great for the cross as well. The more people that can get involved with the battle for the victory, the more entertainment there is, and uh, the more attempts that people will get into watching. Exactly, and that was really nice to see, and I saw the same for Yara Kastelein, who was in the fight for the podium. Eventually, Kastelein lost it on her technique today. There were quite some technical sections still, especially in the woods. Kastelein always struggles there, also struggled in the sand today. So, in a way, I was surprised to see her be able to keep up with that group for second place for so long. Yeah, I think uh, Kastelein has been a lot better in the last few weeks and this is just one of those days that again she was able to do it uh, and uh, she was able to stick with the favorites for as long as possible and uh, yeah just today it really gave me um, I think it was 2018-19 vibes of like the the same five women back at the front of the race uh, all five of them of course, a bit more spread out than uh, sometimes they were back then, but uh, it was really fun to see again. Yeah, I definitely agree. It was good to see, already mentioned Worst, good to see her back at the front and for Kostlein as well, because, yeah, we had a good season start for her. Then she had a part where she had a lot of bad luck in the States and was collecting back end of the top 10 places, and we were like, hmm... Yeah, maybe it was just the start of the season. But then she bounces back now, fourth on this parkour. As I said, very good. Just behind Denise Betsma, who, in my opinion, this just mistimed her peak. She, it's it's normal that you have phases with higher form and lower form in the season. Betsma definitely having one with a bit of lower form now, which isn't bad. Don't get me wrong, because there's a very very busy period coming up in December around Christmas. Probably taking a bit of rest now, so she can use that period to come into peak form for the Nationals and the Worlds. But Betsema, in my opinion, is lacking a bit compared to Overijse Koppenberg and mistimed her peak for the European Championships. Yeah, and I think it, this is also, uh, I think, more exposed by the fact that Lucinda Brandt is looking so strong again. Yeah, there's a truth in that because Brandt, of course, had a cold and was suffering from that and her performances as well ever since Iowa, but look, I mean, Betsema, of course, now is also fighting with Vorst and Kastlein, which she wasn't earlier this season, except with Kastlein and Beringer, but in a way, I guess, it's just, I guess, waiting and see, Betsema did lose the overall lead in the Super Prestige, she went from one point ahead of Brandt to one point behind, but that definitely means that everything is still to play for, so it will be interesting to see what can happen there but we should look at our entire top 10 of course a lot of dutch flags the first eight it was brand to worst betsema kastelein alvarado bakker van der heide van alfa then we saw anna k in ninth and perin clausel in 10th i would like to mention the performance here of alvarado i think alvarado didn't have a great day and personally i believe she was riding with coxide in the back of her head tomorrow the world cup should suit alvarado she likes a bit of sand so I think at some point you saw Alvarado th switching. Okay, I'm not getting a podium here. Let's focus on tomorrow. Yeah, the time gap really isn't representative. Uh, Alvarado was struggling a little bit to keep up with them, but also was able to stabilize the gap for a few laps before it completely fell off a cliff. Uh, yeah, f pretty clearly with uh, Coxide in her mind. And the rider behind Alvarado, Manon Bakker, 6th place, massive improvement for her, she's been struggling this season, we've been 
quite skeptical about the results. There was probably something, we don't know what, nothing has been communicated, but I mean, sixth place by Bakker today. This is kind of where you would expect her based off last season. I mean, sure, some riders aren't here, Peterson, Vash, you can name a couple more, but sixth place, very solid. Yeah, it seems to be that she's slowly uh, riding her way back into form with uh, some good performances every now and then. Uh, but unfortunately, still, like some of those, like fifteenth uh, to twentieth places in between. And uh, but it is looking better and better, especially on the courses courses that would suit her usually. So uh, this is promising, and hopefully, uh, she will uh, slowly work back up to a deserved World Cup place. That's definitely the case in my opinion and I think in a way we can say that the entire Eco Kreland team is improving. I mean we just discussed Kastelein and Bakker, today on the Kant 12th, I mean of course it's not still not great but Kant did have an issue at the start, her chain blocked, she crashed, she already had that issue in Neil where she crashed in the course reckon in the pre-ride, she had a concussion from that, was off the bike for a week and now crashed again so not lucky for Kant but in my opinion, if you can ride back from last place with over a minute down, a bike change, overtake all these riders and 12, you've done a good recovery ride. It's definitely not the level that we have seen previously from Sonnekant, but those times are behind us. I think today, once again, just shows Sonnekant in the non-World Cup races, definitely somebody who could and should be well within the top 10. Yeah, of course, uh, but she still finishes behind Perrine Clausel. Of course, it doesn't help when you have to ride a catch-up race and you're stuck behind a lot of people in the basically single track throughout the forest. Uh, but Perrine Clausel, uh, able to get a 10th place, very good to see. I think uh, it's the first time again since uh, the Koppenberg that she is able to do this. And uh, yeah, it's just good, a nice result and uh, hope to see her again. Definitely, and for our listeners, they shouldn't be confused. This is Perrine Clausel, and it's her sister, Helene Clausel, who was so good in the USA World Cup. So that's why we are more surprised with, by this performance of Perrine than if it would have been Helene. For Helene, we would have probably been slightly disappointed if this was the performance. I am, however, disappointed in the performance of Clara Honsinger, 13th. Once again, not a great start, very anti Honsinger parkour, but I have a theory. Ton, you need to tell me if you agree or disagree. Honsinger, she came here, was very good in Overijs Koppenberg, won the Koppenberg cross, of course, then was forced to sit out the weekend because there were the European Championships here, and then we came to two parkours that weren't for her, Neil and, of course, uh, Tabor. Tabor was still an all-right race, but I think that sitting out that weekend, which she was forced to do because there was no race in Europe for her, that is, in my opinion, what really hampered her. She lost rhythm, and rhythm is super important, especially for someone like Honsinger. We saw it in the beginning of the season as well. She needed to build rhythm, even in the faster races that suited her less, to come into a zone of performance on those faster precautions. She didn't have that rhythm, it got broken up, and in my opinion, that is what is costing Honsinger here. I think it was always going to be uh, a period where she struggled because if you look at the percourses, as you said, they just don't suit her. And uh, especially, for example, today in Max Plus, like if you get stuck behind, it's really hard to get back up. And I guess she never really got the uh, diesel running. And it's, it's very unfortunate to see. Uh, and hopefully uh, we can get to more percourses that suit her. Unfortunately, tomorrow in uh, Coxide, that definitely wouldn't be one of them. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully uh, she can uh, quickly see the tougher, muddier park horses again and uh, we can see good results. Yeah, of course, Honsinger is flying back to the States soon because she is doing the Pan Am Championships, I think, and we're definitely doing the American Championships. So perhaps after that Namur, then we're looking back at the park horses that suit Honsinger. However, her teammate, Katie Close, I will once again mention her, 15th today, being overtaken in the last lap by Anna van Looy, but I think, oh, and Sander Kant, of course, as well. She was in the contention for the back end of the top 10 for some part of the race. 20 years old, again, under 23 rider. Very solid result by the young American, in my opinion. Yeah, it's good to see. It's nice to uh, get some of these results under your belt in Belgium, because, of course, racing in the US, it's a bit different than here. More competition here, of course. 
And uh, yeah, she's just doing very well, I think. Yeah, I think so as well. And uh, I'm excited to see what she can do throughout the rest of the season. Of course, she's working towards the World Championships in her own country in Fayetteville. So yeah, interesting. We should keep an eye on her. I'm definitely seeing uh, a young talent rise there. Anyway, tomorrow we are going to Coxide at Twan, a short prediction and very short brief preview for the men's race. Who do you think is the favorite there? I think we're going to see uh, quite a quite a few people in contention. Um, and Sveikov's looking very good today, actually. So I think uh, with uh, his speciality, of course, being in the sand, that he can certainly make it very tough for the others uh, tomorrow. Sveik, of course, the obvious favorite to look at. I do think that, as you said, there's more people to look at. Isabi didn't look great in the sun today. Arts did, so interesting. I think we'll have an open race. Sveik, definitely one of the favorites based on his record in the sun, but I guess it's just a wait and see, and I think we could be in for a good race there in the women's race. I think we're looking at Brandt and potentially the specialist Betsema. Although Betsema didn't look too great today, just not finding the right line. Uh, and Anomi Wars look quite good to be honest um, so I mean I, I still think it's going to be for Brandt but uh, they should get uh, should get in for a good fight well we'll see you tomorrow we'll be back with a new podcast tomorrow Tuan thank you for joining thanks for having me on and as I said tomorrow we'll be back with uh, the next round of the World Cup Coxide they follow each other rapidly now the World Cups Definitely a classic. Good to see that back on the calendar after the cancellation last year. So we'll be back tomorrow, as said. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we will see you guys then tomorrow. Goodbye.